It's nice to be here. I've never been to uh, Durham before, um, before today. And uh, it's really pretty. I, I meant to get here early today so that I could see some of it, and I ended up going to a, a family wake, which um, was one of those happy, sad occasions um, just outside of Toronto where I got to see a lot of people I haven't seen in years. So that part was nice. Um, it wasn't what I expected. Um, and then I drove to Durham, and actually I didn't notice how many, it was like for the first while getting out of Toronto, it was just like a subdivision for a long time with like a, a lot of stoplights, and then I got to the pretty part of, of Ontario, and uh, I'm really happy to be here. So thank you for having me, words aloud, um, Liz and Terry, who have been in, in touch with me along the way. I'm going to read some poems, and also I'm, I'm starting a tour tomorrow, I'm flying to Denmark, um, so to play music, so I brought, so I had my guitar with me, so I brought it, so I'm going to play a couple songs to finish off. Oh good, okay. <laughs> I'm glad that is going to be well received here in the poetry night. Um, I'll start by telling you a little bit about myself. Subtlety was never my specialty. And so without much thought to consequence, I showed my heart and soul to many. I left little guessing I was that book lying open in full view unprotected. Some people told me I should close it up. At least choose more carefully which pages to show, maybe don't expose so much. Apparently, there is an appropriate amount of sharing, and I overdo it. People are only comfortable up to a certain point, and yet I go right through it. Well, maybe I missed the training. That day, they went over closed book and open book, and how much was too much information. Or else, I was there, but the lesson must have lost me. Because I thought its elements were slightly off, and how could they possibly be the same for us all? These days, I am trying to find a fine balance with this. Give people a view of my sincere self while keeping some things concealed within. Because I was told that I should. And I'm curious to see what it might get me, and I'm hoping it could be something good. Like improved defenses. Or a heart less tormented. Because if I didn't let as many people in it to begin with, I would be less likely to be injured when I left it. If I could be more subtle, no one would know when I was broken. As it stands right now, though, I tend to break right open, spill out over coffee shop tables, and try not to be noticed by the other patrons because people don't like to see random strangers crying. It makes them anxious. <laughs> if I could be more subtle, I wouldn't make anybody anxious. I wouldn't make them order their coffees to take away because they were afraid if they got them to stay, I would ask to borrow their hankies. I would be normal, meaning discreet, and this could be sort of amazing. But subtlety was never my specialty, and so maybe it's going to be hard to suddenly start changing, holding people away, knowing when to keep them out and when to bring them close and how to differentiate. Anyway, I want people to know me. And so that means the whole me, all the many parts of me, the fragile and the tortured and the happy human heart in me. And so subtlety is just never going to be my specialty. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I, have a, I have a book, just one book, not 16, like some other people in this room. <laughs> Um, and anyway, it's out there in the in the in the bookstore, um, and this poem is in it. It's I, I don't write too many love poems, although the older I get, I write them a few a few more. Uh, I write them a bit more often. But I did I do think about how much we talk about or I talk about love when I don't have it versus when I have it. So I've been actively trying to change that and talk about it when it's happening. But this is a poem about about that kind of thing is for my lovers, her once the sun's in my sky. I'm sorry I never ravished you enough and that there is nothing to be done about the passing of time. Ravish your lover while you still love her. Remember your lovers, but especially don't forget them. When they are standing in their bedroom with their hair disheveled and their clothes strewn, Notice them as they stand before you, as there they lie. Tell them that you're touched a hundred times of every inch. Take a picture with your unabashed eye. 
Because this will change as pictures fade, so does love die. Smell your lovers, their wide open skin like bare shoulders before toast in the morning. Pheromones will be what you don't know you miss. When you're standing beside exes feeling suddenly nostalgic, could be soap, could be freshly washed clothes. Most likely, though, it's the mix of hidden chemicals, that silent scent that perfumers will never get, but you will remember it long after love goes, so hold your lovers close. When you are drifting off, sharing oxygen and oxytocin both. Memorize the napes of their necks, the crooks of their wrists, the way their breathing rises and falls. Knees only get cuddled in one kind of spot. And they will miss this once the spoon is gone, like you will miss the puzzle when you don't get to be a part. And so while you are, with limbs entangled in ways that warm your heart, remember to notice this, so that the last night doesn't go by without you noticing. And only in the sunshine do you know these things. While you pine for one more chance to lay with your loved one when night is falling, this is a plea, mostly for me, so I may remember next time I am to be a puzzle piece. Also for the lovers I have held and known, who have been my comforts as well as my abrasions. I remember the days our skin was first waking, and of the love we made then, like we were scorched earth and it was raining. Thank you. Thanks. Um, we got to eat Chinese food for dinner. <laughs> and uh, I haven't gotten to sit around in a small town and eat Chinese food for a long time. I grew up, I'm from PEI actually, so I don't know anybody is, if anyone has been to Summerside PEI. There is a couple Chinese restaurants there too. <laughs> Um, anyway, it was really nice. It, it's nice to be here. Um, and the place where I'm staying, they have two dogs, two cats, and birds. So um, it's, I, it, I go on tour a lot, and I have a cat at home, and it's just like these little things that make me feel more happy, like cats. Anyway, this is not about cat. Uh, so this is, a, I, I did a show this summer, uh, a one-person show that was mo mostly me talking for a, a long time and um, r in rhymes. And uh, it, was about, it was about love. Uh, it was about different kinds of love. It was kind of about polyamory, which I don't think gets a whole lot of air time. <laughs> um, so I've been trying to give it some. <laughs> Here in your small town. Um, so anyway, this is, a, this, is, this is just like a commentary on love. I think that regardless of, of how people want to love, that's cool, but I think it's, it's nice to, to open up formulas across all walks of life, whether it's about love or, or work or um, sex or God or whatever it is. I, I like to take a good formula and like smash it. <laughs> so. <laughs> love looks like this. A partnership, a man and woman with a little kid, a hand-holding couple headed towards marriage, two lesbians, two gay men. One plus one makes two, that's just mathematics. Two is the only unit worth having, that's just the fact of it. The fact is, love looks like this. A picture of a happy pair standing in the sunset there. Now, they have found their one. Now, all their cares are done. Or at least if they are not all gone, they are lessened because they solved a big one. Love looks like the movies. Love sounds like the symphony during a movement very moving. Love reads like a novel, truly, and also it's your duty to find it. Love is a quest, don't you know you're on it? Don't you know it's complicated and difficult and elusive and painful and you'll be ridiculed for failing, so don't fail now. Love looks like a disheveled professional by the blackjack table with his head down. That's because love is a gamble. What are you set to lose? Everything. Look at their hand you're dealt. It's risky. Definitely, you could lose everything. All of your dignity exiting your being expertly. Love seeping like poison, leaving vessels because they're broken. Water flowing can't control it down the drain. Love looks like the crud in the sink that remains. 
Love looks like the hunched woman who will never stand straight again. It looks like straight arrows sent from well-crafted bows off a sight line straight and narrow from the tip of Cupid's nose. Love looks like something you're supposed to be in, so even if your feet are rightly freezing, don't go. The scholars know. The method and the formula, they must. They've written volumes for us. Love looks like research in a library locked up, collecting lots of dust. Oh, except critics burned these buildings down, claiming that heretics wrote the wrong words down. Specialists know what love's about, and they will spell it out. So here's a blueprint. So all the bloopers are you, imperfect. And every blemish is your trespass. Come on, what's wrong? Don't you know love looks like this? And if you don't fit the description we've all been given, you must be doing something wrong. Two heads strong. If you are alone, it is your fault. If you love more than one, then a pervert is clearly what you are, only self-regard. If you choose not to play along, you are a lost cause. If you choose not to pass your genes on, you'll break your mother's heart. You'd look good with a baby in your arms, so do your part. If you like sex with all the sexes that there are, you might be indecisive or just desperate. Take what you can get, and maybe they'll see your effervescence as a threat. Love is a method, and you, my dear, look like you haven't mastered it yet. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. So uh, I wonder what else I can tell you about myself in this next 20 minutes. Probably a lot of things, but... Um, <laughs> okay, so I, I, I hitchhiked out to Vancouver once and became a hippie for a while, and that was fun. <laughs> and, uh, and I, I, but I grew up in a Catholic family on PEI, and I was, I was a super Catholic. I said prayers until I was 20 every night. And uh, so I have a lot of, like, things got really messy inside my head for a while. Uh, not messy anymore, it's all, it's all like, I got it sewed together now, okay. <laughs> I went to a spiral dance tonight and there were a lot of really cute women there and, and a, a guy who was probably like a male lesbian or something. And, and then afterwards there was this potluck and I got so full because I ate so much food and, and I wore this really awesome skirt that I stole from Valley of Village. I definitely felt moved. Yeah, and, and someone brought cookies, like, in a bag, like, from the store, which is not very healthy, but, but I ate some. They're kind of like the broken-down tractors in an otherwise beautiful golden field, a bit of an eyesore, but also really compelling. It might have been the sugar, but I'm working on sugar. Yeah, I think it interferes with my chi, it blocks it, or makes me vibrate too high or too fast or something. Yeah, sugar's bad, like, like TV like movies made in Hollywood, like karma can be, like drugs if you have too much, but moderation is okay, helps my brain expand. Anyway, so at this dance, me and some friends decided to start a little mini coven, except for learning what it means to be pagan instead of having rituals and strict dedications. And since I am a pagan now and everything, I, I better learn what that means, so I know what to say when people ask me. It's not just about making vows in the night, or little black cats, although I love little black cats. No, it's, it's more than that, it's, uh, it's dirt, earth. Yeah. 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 Being on it, G good on it, to it, being good to it. Yeah, that's important. Because it is like my mother, I am to it umbilically corded. Actually, I just wanna feel connected. I've been trying really hard for a long time. And when I left my old religion, it was like I stabbed myself, but I didn't get to die. And now I have a scar and some residual pain, and I would like a new faith to stand beside. And it could be the umbrella and life's the rain, and I'm the bougie lady who just wishes to stay dry. Can you blame me? Really? Some people have warned me, scorned me for exploring, and I remain courteous as I tend to do. But if I was bold, I would have told them what my soul was going through. Listen, it is lonely in the doldrums, and I'm tired. And I've been a solo practitioner for a while now, except all that I am practicing is not practicing anything at all. I know it is cool these days to say you are an atheist, but I have no faith in this. 
I know creationism is just a story based in fantastical glory, but atheism is just a story too, or else it is the page left blank, and that is no more true, that is boring news. Just another concept for us all to cling on to. But wait, I am lonely. Did I not just say this? I want someone to hold me. I want something to own up to. Maybe covens will provide me with hugs and love and soul food. Cracks over the head when I am lingering in bed thinking, what's the point and why are we all here and who the hell do I belong to? Maybe Wiccans will insist I am worthy, make me feel less crazy. Maybe these spiral dances could be substitutions for a marriage and a baby, and since I am an earth dweller, I may as well be pagan. Except, I don't know if I, I believe this, not all of it, some of it, the rest of it is merely fodder, but if I belong somewhere and I believe something, I will have justification for, for being a human being. It will make more things okay. I think of this today while I seek a faith that will not sway, but every time I find a flag, the wind blows and my pole breaks and I'm on my knees trying to make it make one piece and it overwhelms me and it does dismay. What if I am just a person and religion just a tale and paganism merely religion with a different but still limiting veil? How do I reconcile my desire to belong with the knowledge that this is just another system with its flaws, different gods to hail? And what of the fact that I keep changing my mind? And if I call myself a pagan now, what have I left behind and who? There is no heaven for earth dwellers, so when I die, will I see my mother again, ever? And when I am here, does this distinction disconnect me from my peers? Like, when I was living as a Christian, did it give me a division sharp and clear? Religion is divisive, but I understand its mission as I reason with its grace. All these people living, we just need a reason, we just need a safer place. It's communion, and I want a little taste. So, I go exploring again, surround myself with Buddhists. It's no surprise I don't fit here either, I am only Buddhist. I meditate just for 12 minutes, eat my food too fast while reading the cereal box ingredients, obsessively thinking about the greater meaning of things or is crowding on my internal highways and I don't like their holidays as much as Christmas. Shit, I get no presents, I must be selfish. <laughs> or else I am spiritually unhealthy, unworthy, or else I keep searching and nothing measures up. To what? I just want a little bit of love, or else a whole lot or an explanation for humanity, I mean the whole lot. I want to reach my arms out somewhere and belong. Someone to calm my thoughts. I went to a spiral dance one night, and then I got dizzy, and then I got lost. Thank you. You guys are as nice as they all said. <laughs> okay, I'm going to play a couple poems, and uh, I'll finish with a song, and, uh, and then um, I'm going to go eat whatever snacks are left on the table. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thanks for uh, bringing this amp. I brought my guitar, but I didn't have an amplifier, so uh, Randy provided it. Thank you. I thought of two things today. I thought about poetry, and I thought about you. And extensions of these two things, like poetry about you, and poems that you'd fit into. Poetics we enacted last night with such passion and where that might in fact lead to. Now that last night is through, and I sit here alone this afternoon, and I don't know where you sit or with whom. 
I thought of poems I might compose, where this might go between us now, how slow. I thought about not thinking about you, but that didn't seem to happen like I wanted it to. So I wrote a new poem. You were the subject. I wrote a true ode. You were the subject. I wrote and I wrote. I thought about you in poems. I thought about these two subjects. sneak a song in. This, this isn't even a poem at all. I'm not even going to pretend this is a poem. <laughs> Sometime I, I do. Um, so when I lived in Vancouver after I was a hippie, <laughs> I became an activist uh, for a while. Uh, trying out, I just try out a bunch of identities until I get tired and try something else. I change a lot, basically. Um, uh, I'm pro-change. And uh, while I was there, I tried to work in offices, uh, in nonprofit, like doing good work for, for people. And I really was really very bad at it. And um, so then I, I, got, I developed quite a guilt complex. I felt, I felt shitty for doing good work and getting paid and being no good at it. Like, oh, it was awful. <laughs> so I would, I would kind of wake up and cry and then come home and cry. <laughs> <laughs> I have volatile emotional being, so I just shouldn't, just don't leave me in an office. It's just not very good. Anyway, so I got, so I quit that job, and eventually I, I came back across the country and settled on the east and started doing this job, which I like much better. <laughs> um, it's this set of challenges works with my personality more. Anyway, um, so this is a song that goes out to anyone who got, who gets to quit a job, who got to quit a job. And I do recognize it's quite a privilege to uh, get to do that. And we don't all get to do that, and we won't all get to do that. So I, you know, I, f I take that, that responsibility on. Um, so, but if you get to do that and you're in the position, then, you know, please. <laughs> Some of the people thought that I was crazy for leaving all that. But they didn't see me at seven in the morning in the months before I left. Within a few minutes of opening my eyes, there was the dread of the day. Sitting by my bed waiting for me to rise and pretend like everything's okay. And it makes for bad digestion when you are crying onto your toast. And if that's how breakfast goes, you know you're in for it. And I had no intentions then, go to work and come back home. My steps heavy and slow every minute of it. I could be a person climbing up a ladder and checking the right boxes, moving through the brackets higher and higher with more gains than losses. And I could have a cottage in a pretty spot and make it there twice a year. 
and all the other months in the city with my job, my money, my tears, oh. And the glory of the morning did fade and dim when once it was my best love and I was so grateful for it. But those days working with no passion did change all of this and it wasn't worth the happy breakfasts that I missed. So on one gorgeous morning, I told them I was leaving. And it was so relieving to say it out. And I worked hard all afternoon and the weeks before the leaving. And finally one evening was my last walk out. Thanks. Thank you. So I just have one more uh, thing to play for you. Um, again, thanks to Words Aloud 9 <laughs> for having me here. Um, if anybody knows anyone in Copenhagen, I'm playing on Vush, Vush Street at bar blah, 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 tomorrow, uh, Saturday night, uh, Sunday night. <laughs> um, I'm sure it'll be an adventure. <laughs> um, my name's Tanya Davis, I'm from Halifax. Uh, I also should mention I have a couple CDs, they're in the book room, um, but I'm going to take them away when I leave because I need to bring them back to my guitar case to leave this town. So if you want any after the show, you can buy them. Uh, but I think my books will be around for the weekend, but my CDs, um, they won't be. So just, and I'm on the, I'm Googleable, so you know, no pressure or anything. I'm on the internet. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. This is a song called Art. It's about art. Art was a man my mother thought I met. <laughs> no. <laughs> She was really happy when she heard this song. She's like, who's art? <laughs> I wondered what would be the worth of my words in the world. If I write them and then recite them, are they worth being heard? Just because I like them, does that mean that I should mic them and see what might unfurl? And I think of the significance of my opinions here. Is it significant to be giving them? Does anybody care? Just because I'm into this, does that mean that I should live like it? And really, do I dare? Art, art, I want you. Art, you make it pretty hard not to. My heart is trying hard here to follow you, but I can't always tell if I ought to. So I pondered the point of my art in this life. If I make it, will someone take it and think that it's genuine? Would they be glad that I did? Because they got something good out of it. Would they leave me and be any more inspired? And I question the outcome of the outpouring of myself. If I tell everyone my stories, would this keep me healthy and well? Would it give me purpose and to the world some sort of service? Is it worth it? How could I tell?
this would be the part where um, my drummer would be playing a really awesome solo. <laughs> um, but instead, uh, I just want to thank all the other poets and readers and people who did beautiful things. I feel inspired. You make it pretty hard not to My heart is trying hard here To follow you But I can't always tell if I ought to Art, art, I want you Art, you make it pretty hard not to My heart is trying hard here To follow you But I can't always tell if I ought to Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>